Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. It is January 3rd, 2018, and we are here in Boston at Takeometrics World Headquarters. And today we're going to be doing a sponsored products masterclass. So thank you to everyone who's joining. On the uh, call today, what we'll be doing is going through um, a whole bunch of, of content. And we want to dive right into that content. But first, we're going to do just a quick introduction of the team. So my name is Joe Duby. I am the product manager here at Takeometrics. I've been here with the company for just over two years now, working with hundreds of sellers on not only their sponsored products campaigns, but all aspects of their Amazon business. And I'm lucky to be joined in the room by Megan. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm part of the customer su success team. And just like Joe, have been working with hundreds of sellers for a little over two years now, too. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. And joining us also to add a little bit of color into the conversation is our director of product design, Will. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for joining. Awesome. And just a, a little bit of housekeeping for everyone as everyone is joining in. We have uh, several members of the team also responding to questions. So as those come up, please do write in your questions. We'll also be kicking off uh, three polls throughout the conversation to keep this uh, interactive and, and get some feedback from you along the way. So let's dive right in. Uh, the agenda today, we're going to first just be talking about how sponsored products impacts your business, going through how to achieve those goals through advertising, and then we'll be spending a majority of the afternoon going through three and four here, the fundamentals of campaign creation and the fundamentals of keywords and search terms. So what can sponsored products do for your Amazon business? So we've, we've referenced this in prior webinars, but I, I think it, it is important to get started with, and, and that's that flywheel effect. That's what every business is looking for on Amazon, and what sponsored products help kick off is getting you that increased exposure. So with more exposure, you're going to get more sales, and with those more sales, you're going to get higher organic sales rank. So it's really a virtuous cycle here of getting more eyeballs on your products, more conversions, having those sales that you're picking up that you would not have gotten without sponsored products, helping your overall business and getting your organic listings uh, more visibility as well. And I think it's pretty important here to think about how sponsored products kind of compounds on your business over time. If you start out later, not only are you paying more money because bids are just going to continually go up, but also if you start now, over time, you're going to get more sales, which is going to bring you higher up. And it's just, it's, it is that virtuous cycle. Um, so really, it, it, there's no better time than now. Great. And now we're going to launch our first poll. So we're curious to see how many of you out there, how long have you been using sponsored products to advertise on Amazon? And we'll give everyone a few seconds to respond to the poll, and then we will share the results. So just looking for some feedback on how long you've been using SP. Have you not yet tried it? Uh, are you fairly new, zero to six months, or, or are you a seasoned vet having done it for, for over two years? So it's going to be interesting to see where everyone on the webinar fits in, into these buckets. I would be really surprised if, if there are some of you who have been out there uh, for two years because yeah. – that's a long time. Newer, yeah, you were definitely uh, ahead of the trend. So. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. It looks like majority of you have voted now. Just share the results with everyone. It looks like the majority of you have been using it for zero to six months. So just getting started and ramping up, um, getting that visibility for your products. And it's great. 15% uh, of you haven't used it yet. This webinar is going to be perfect for kicking you off. Um, we're going to be going into a lot of campaign structure stuff, so that will really help. And for those of you who have been here for two years plus, hopefully you can find a, a lot of golden nuggets throughout this that will help you uh, take your uh, campaigns a little bit further. So thanks. Awesome. So thanks to everyone for voting. So now we want to talk more about those business objectives and your goals and how you can use SP to leverage uh, increased visibility uh, on your products. So when we think about sponsored products and how to use it, I typically break it down into three main buckets of what we see sellers using sponsored products for. Uh, the first one is a product launch. So if you're just getting started, whether it's your first product or your thousandth product, 
the best way to get those initial customers to that, those product pages is through sponsored products. You can pay for those keywords that you would never have ranked for organically because you have very little sales history and get your product in front of those customers searching for those specific terms. And really, I think it's incredibly important before starting with sponsored products to have strategies for your products before going in. Everybody kind of finds sponsored products because they're like, oh, I'm just going to have increased sales. But really, it can be used for so much more within your business. And before you even set up those campaigns, start to figure out what your ACoS targets are, it really is important to make sure that you structure all of your campaigns by those strategies and your products by those strategies. Yeah, and we're going to get into the specifics of that campaign structure and, and how to get yourself situated. But going into this middle bullet point here of, of liquidating inventory, this is something that we've seen uh, sellers use with a lot of success where they're coming up maybe against a long-term storage fee um, and they have a, perhaps a product that they're looking to to liquidate or they're no longer they're discontinuing it they're no longer selling it rather than you know paying to have it removed or shipped back to you or trying to sell it on another platform you can get those a, additional views through using sponsored products and i've actually seen a lot of success with sellers after the holidays with that excess inventory that they thought would sell through and didn't that's a great way to actually get that moving as well absolutely uh and and the last here is more of uh sort of a, a constant or a steady state where you're not launching something, you're not retiring a product, but you're looking to drive those incremental profitable sales. So in these types of campaigns, you may have uh, a target or, or sort of your threshold for spend may be lower, but we always recommend running sponsored products. And we'll get into sort of looking at your entire catalog, but we always recommend running it for all of your products, even if it is a smaller investment, because those incremental sales, again, going back to the flywheel, are going to help your overall business. And this is really for all your products, every single product and all the lifestyle stages. So whether it's old, mature, brand new. Absolutely. And, and you know, we get questions of, you know, well, if I'm ranking organically, should I still be running sponsored products? And, and I, I always say absolutely, because it never hurts to have additional placement on that Amazon page. And if you're not doing it, your competitors will be. So to set the stage a little bit before we get into the, the meat of the, of the presentation today, I want to go through some terminology because this is really important to understand what we'll be talking about. So the first is a campaign. So this is the largest umbrella in sponsored products, and this is how you're going to organize your advertisements. And in a campaign, they're all under one single budget. With campaigns, we have two types, automatic and manual. And we're going to get into what each of those mean and how to use them together. The next level is an ad group. So underneath a campaign, you're able to group your products even further into ad groups. <laughs> And under each of these uh, ad groups on the automatic side, that's where you'll set your bid. On the manual side, you have another layer, which is the keyword. Before you get to the keyword, you have the ad. And in this case, with sponsored products, the ad is the actual product. It's a, it corresponds to a SKU in your portfolio. And with sponsored products, it's not like other advertising platforms where you have, you know, a, adjustable copy or you can edit the image or, or really configure anything. The ad is simply your SKU, your listing. It's going to be the primary image there in the title of your product. And your SKU is going to be eligible for advertising only when you're in the buy box. So even if you're a reseller and you're on a listing with multiple other sellers, you can still leverage sponsored products because your ad won't be eligible for impressions if you're not in the buy box. So you're never at risk of paying for clicks and sending, uh, sending the buyers on Amazon to someone else's product page. And then under, underneath that, we have keywords. So when you create a manual campaign, you're going to select the keywords that you'd like to bid on. And with those keywords, there's three types. We have broad, phrase, and exact. And we're going to get into how to use each of those and the advantages of each. And then the, the key differentiation here between a keyword and a search term is really important to understand. Here what we have is the search term is going to be what the, the actual user on Amazon.com is entering into that search bar. The keyword is what you're setting up in your sponsored products campaign. 
and dozens or hundreds of search terms can correspond to one single broad keyword. Great, so now that we've learned those basics such as campaign, ad, and even ad group, let's go into how to create campaigns. And this is actually really under looked concept where you know a lot of sellers actually kind of just carelessly throw products together into campaigns but this is actually really important to build out success for sponsor products so let's dive into our next poll we're wondering for everyone out there how do you use sponsor products is it product launch going over those different business objectives is it your um, liquidating your inventory are you looking for inc incremental sales or all the above, or are you not using sponsored products? Yeah, so this this just should ma map to what we were talking about, about those overarching strategies. So are you primarily using it? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see see what the poll comes in, comes in with. It looks like uh, almost everyone's done voting at this point. We'll just give it a few more seconds. You can go ahead and close it, Megan. All right. I'm going to share those results. And thanks to everyone for voting. We really uh, appreciate the interactivity here. Uh, keeps it interesting for us as well. So uh, it looks like sort of makes sense, right? Most people are using it for all of the above. So for some combination of launching products, liquidating inventory, or, or those incremental sales. And sort of mapping back to that first poll, about 15% of you on the line today haven't yet used sponsored products. So I hope I hope you can learn something and uh, start kicking off those first campaigns. Great. All right. So I'm going to jump into the first fundamental part of campaign creation. And this is probably a big question that Joe and I get all the time. You know, what should I advertise? Do I advertise my entire catalog? Do I advertise my best sellers? Do I advertise just new products? And we definitely recommend starting with your entire catalog rather than just relying on your gut instinct. Use the data, um, let those products run in campaigns. And then from there, if it doesn't make sense for you to run certain products, then we definitely recommend, um, you know, using what's best for, you know, your business to advertise from there. So it really is going to depend on if you're a smaller seller, a bigger seller, and a brand or a reseller. So the step number two is once you've defined what you want to advertise, you also want to go ahead and organize that section of your catalog. This is actually going to start to create that hierarchy of the campaigns like Joe is talking about. So first you want to start with um, similar products and you can group them by product type. So like in our example here, if you sell a whole bunch of different products, you may want to separate out, separate out by if you're selling raincoats versus tents, or if you have specific product lines or styles, and even parent SKUs. So this is good for sellers who have a lot of variations such as um, shoe sellers or clothing sellers. Um, that's gonna be really useful. Yeah, and, and Megan, what, what we recommend, you know, when thinking about this is just pull this up in Excel. Have, have, your, have your inventory out there and start creating additional columns and breaking down your product types or your styles or, or breaking it down by parent SKU so that you have that full list and you're being disciplined about what where, which product goes into which category. Yeah, we often see sellers just put products into one, right? One big category, and there's really lack of relevancy. So that's really what you want to focus on. Is Amazon is a big search engine, and you need to put yourself as if a customer is searching for your product there. So step number three in organizing your products into campaigns is. Like Joe said, you really need to focus on your business objectives. Not all your products are going to share the same objective, unless you're a new seller. Maybe you have you're launching all your products, but you want to say, am I going to be focusing on profitability for these? Um, you know, are we going to liquidate them because they're aged inventory for long-term storage fees, for example? Or are we going to be launching it? Do we want to gain additional exposure? Because this is actually going to dictate how we're going to be investing money into those campaigns. So, so think about that spreadsheet and where you have all of your products, you have what category they are, is it the backpacks, tents, and raincoats, and then go one layer further of what's my objective with this group of products? Because you may have some tents that you're looking to launch and others that are more mature where you're looking for that profitability goal. So you're going to want to go that step further, which is this step number three that Megan just outlined, and group them not only by product type, but, but what your objective is. Because it's going to really 
depend on how much you're willing to spend. So if in a product launch, you're going to be much more willing to have a higher ACOS, which is your advertising cost of sale, your spend divided by your sales. Whereas with profitability, you may only want to be spending five or 10% of your total sales from sponsored products on those advertising. So just to make this clear for everybody on the, on the line, would you set up something like a campaign, like a profitability campaign under, let's say, product type, which would be tense, and then have another campaign, which would be an aged inventory yep. campaign that would have the same product type of tent? Definitely, because you're going to want to treat those separately and allocate spend differently there. Um, right. Whether you want to be more aggressive with bidding, less aggressive, but we'll definitely get into that in a little bit. And, cool. and the campaign is the only level at which you can set that budget. So thinking back to when you're setting these up in Seller Central, if they were all in a single campaign, you don't have that level, uh, that lever of budget to, to control if there's different objectives within the same campaign. Especially if it's a product launch. You want to have a product launch budget, there you go. There's your, your marketing expenses. Cool. So the next step is taking it that, that level deeper. In, you know, underneath the campaigns, we have our ad groups. So the ad groups essentially are going to be holding those ads and this is where we want to get a little more specific in how we're categorizing your product. So we have a couple of examples here just to kind of walk you through how this process works. So for our raincoats campaign, um, we're, we're finding that there's three different uh, audiences here, men's, women's, and kids. We're going to want to break down the products that way just because that's how customers are going to be searching for your products in those different buckets there. And it makes it that much easier when you're adding keywords into each of these ad groups that you can make those men specific keywords or the kids raincoat specific terms and they can be grouped in that ad group. But the overall campaign is going to have that single budget and that single objective. If you do find that there's ad groups that you have different objectives on, you're going to want to pull those out and make them their own campaign. And it's completely fine to have a single ad group in a campaign. Don't feel like you have to be adding multiple ad groups to one campaign. It's very, very much a, a standard practice to have just a, a single ad group under yeah, one campaign. Very common. I've seen that a lot. And a good tip to find out how your customers are searching for products to take it that step further is using your customer search term report. And that's actually going to show you actual customer search term data and how they're finding your product. So how you want to be dividing that up. So along the lines of breaking your campaigns down into ad groups, you want to be naming them as well as you go. And this is actually a very important step. A lot of you may be thinking, oh, I'll just put ad group one or something. And that's actually not going to help you in the long run when you're scaling and building out your business. You're not going to know what products are in there. So you definitely want to be really specific with the naming conventions. So men's raincoats, women's raincoats, kids' raincoats, rather than ad group one there. Yeah, and, and this is something that we'll see when um, a seller may, may come to take a metrics and, and have us help with their, their campaign setup or, or the optimization is that they simply just use the default name, ad group yeah. one. <laughs> and it's really difficult to extrapolate any data there if it's just all generic names and you're not sure which products are in which ad groups. So by make it, make it easier on yourself, you know, make that initial investment when you're doing the setup. So that down the line, as you're optimizing, you don't have to spend so much time diving in and trying to figure out what is ad group one? Yep. What did I put in here? Um, <laughs> Save just, yourself the headache. <laughs> exactly. And a good kind of formula to think about it is put in the category, of the product, the objective, and the campaign type. Yeah, I mean, put put in, if it's an automatic campaign, yeah. put new raincoats automatic right there in the title so you don't have to look any further. And talking about automatic campaigns, we just want to note the differences between manual ads. They're both a critical part in really having a great campaign structure and the success of your ads. So automatic is definitely more for exploration. Um, you're looking for relevant customer searches since it's running against the product page um, details there. So when we say it, it's pulling that that data from the, for the product page, what does that mean? That means it's, it's looking at your titles, your bullet points, your descriptions, all of that data that you've entered into Seller Central, and Amazon is matching that with relevant search terms. So if you haven't spent time yet optimizing that content, you, you may be cautious around starting uh, spending advertising because if you, you have junk in the title and, and bullet points and descriptions and your images aren't optimized, you don't want to be paying for those clicks if you know those customers aren't going to convert. 
So before you get started with automatic campaigns, make sure you spend some time on your product page listings. Yeah. And how can you tell if you're getting good clicks or not? Um, can you look at the search term report to figure that out or how would yeah. you find that out? Yeah, the customer search term report is going to show you exactly what that customer is searching and whether it produced any conversions or not for those, those sales. So I think that'll be a really good indicator of whether your product listings in the automatic is, you know, they're pulling up relevant search terms or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you find that after taking a look at the customer search term report that your automatic campaigns are being served to customers that are using terms that aren't relevant to your products, go back to that product page and, and make sure you don't have any irrelevant data in there. Great. And then the manual campaigns, um, the other counterpart there, ads are targeted a lot more specifically because you can add in those keywords like Joe was mentioning. And you can actually set the bid at that level and use different match types. So a lot more control, a lot more targeted to find that right audience. Right. And, and the key here, too, is that by having specific keywords that you're bidding on, you're able to adjust those bids and be more aggressive on terms that work well for you. So if something's converting into sales, you want to do more of that. If it's not working for you, you want to do less and, and not be spending as much. With the automatic, you don't have the control of selecting which search terms you're served up against. You have one single bid for the entire ad group. So it, you're missing out if you're not using manual campaigns. Um, you're missing out on that optimization. And another point here is, is we'll get asked all the time, how many, how many keywords is the right number of keywords? <laughs> and there, there's, there's no real answer there, but I always you know, recommend it's, it's not about quantity here. It's about quality and, and learning over time. You know, I've seen people enter in thousands of, well, a thousand is the maximum per ad group, but creating dozens of ad groups and putting in thousands and thousands of keywords. And that's really not where I see the successful sellers. I see them maybe having 20 to 40 keywords in each ad group, but continuing to listen to the data, see how customers are searching and making those optimizations each week. So now that we've touched upon automatic and manual and the benefits of both, we definitely want to go into how that relates to your campaign structure. So being able to utilize both forms, we like to call this the explore and exploit strategy, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, you're actually able to just take advantage of the entire platform sponsored product. So setting up a mirrored campaign structure, having that automatic campaign, and with that right naming convention, basically have that same exact manual campaign. Right. So we talked about taking all of your products, grouping them into the product type and the objective and then when you create your first set of campaigns, create two of them, one automatic and one manual. And we're going to get into specifically why that's the best way to go. So I have a, a good question in here uh, from a gentleman named Jeffrey. He's asking, let's say I want to restructure my campaigns that have already been running for an extended period, but don't want to lose my data. What do I do? Yeah, great question from Jeffrey. And Will, thanks, thanks for joining everyone. And please do keep the questions coming in. Um, what, what we recommend there is to, to start setting up those new campaigns while leaving those older ones running. So you don't want to switch them off too quickly because you may see a, a drop in conversions. So while you set up your new campaigns in the structure that you've maybe put some more thought into, start you know, dialing the budget up on those new campaigns. And as they get traction, you can start dialing back um, your, your budgets on the older campaigns. But still, you can inform those new campaigns with all of the data from the previous campaign. So pull down that search term report, you know, filter it based on the number of conversions you've gotten from each search term, and make sure you're putting in those winning keywords into your new campaigns. Cool. Yeah. So with the mirror campaign structure, we can now take advantage of the explore and exploit strategy. So really taking advantage of both types of campaigns, exploring search term data in the automatic and then exploiting it in the manual because we have a lot more control and we can target those keywords a lot more effectively with that bid at that keyword level. Right. And, and what we get a lot of questions on is, you know, where do I start with keywords? And mm -hmm. there's. You know, I always tell sellers, you know, you, use your gut to some extent with, you know, what what keywords are going to be highly relevant to your products. But you should also be relying on the data you're getting directly from Amazon. 
Amazon's never going to give you the organic search data of how people are ending up on your page through the organic search, but you get access to that data if you use sponsored products. So even if you don't think, you know, sponsored products, you know, you don't want to invest heavily in it in the future, you need to be doing that to at least capture the data on the search terms of how people are getting to your products and, and where they're the, the strongest terms are and how they're checking out. So, you know, always rely more heavily on that data than, than your gut in the long term of what's actually converting. And we've actually seen a lot of sellers turn off the automatic too early. Right. And we actually don't recommend that. We actually recommend leaving it running just because customers are finding your products in new ways every single day, especially as Amazon's growing. Right. Um, so definitely leaving that running, you're going to find new and new ways that they're converting there. Yeah. And I mean, just even think about it seasonally. We saw a lot of search terms leading up to the, the Christmas holiday with the, you know, the term gift in them, where there may not be that search term um, throughout the rest of the year. So you always want to sort of have your ear to the ground and you can sort of think about the automatic campaign as that you know, way to listen to the customers and see how Amazon is matching your products to search terms. And, and when we say exploit, sort of what we're what we're saying there is, again, back to the how how you bid. On the automatic side, you have one single bid. So you can think about if there's a very competitive search term, maybe you're not getting placement on it if your automatic bid is too low, because that one single bid corresponds to thousands and thousands of search terms that Amazon is matching you to. By pulling out those winners. You can say, you know, if I have a bid of one dollar on the automatic side, I may be willing to spend two dollars on on a term that converts really well because I know that every click I'm more likely to get a sale on that term. And even the refined match types, that's just going to help you double down on that higher bid and that keyword there. So now that we've gone over a couple elements of campaign creation, now it's putting them all together and building them in Seller Central. So um, first, you'd want to use that naming convention that we talked about, building out your automatic, so new raincoats automatic, and we'll be going over daily budget in a little bit, but this is where you want to note that. So if you're having a new product launch, you want to definitely allocate your marketing budget for that right here. And start date, end date, we actually recommend not setting an end date. We actually see a lot of people put an end date of like maybe a couple months down the road, but let it run. Yeah. I mean, we've seen people have an end date in there and they forget and then yeah. they go a couple days without running sponsored like, products. They yeah. see their sales are hurting and they wonder why and they look back and, oh, I haven't, I haven't been running my, my SP campaigns. Definitely use the, the pause setting as a, a trigger there. So right. on that. Yeah. Once something is archived, you can't unarchive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, pause uh, is, is your friend if you want to stop for just a short amount of time before getting started. It again and yeah. where would you set that pause that that's right in campaign um, manager right uh, right next to the campaign cool yep. um, and then once you get to the ad group level you'll want to use that naming convention continued here as well so then you can put those appropriate ads underneath and a more advanced strategy for especially for larger sellers with a lot more products is creating them in bulk so you can actually find the bulk file template under campaign manager and bulk operations. You can download that there and you can actually build out that hierarchy right here. So this is actually going to streamline the yeah. campaign building, especially with the mirrored campaign structure. So you can replicate it right into the manual from the automatic. Yeah. And if you think back to what we were talking about earlier, saying, you know, take your entire portfolio, break it down by that category and that objective. You can take that exact spreadsheet, do some copying and pasting here uh, and upload it directly into Seller Central. So think about how easy that will be, especially for those sellers that have, you know, more than a handful of products. You can get all of your campaigns set up within a few minutes rather than clicking through those screens in campaign manager. A lot easier. <laughs> yeah. And the other advantage here too is, is how easy it is to create the mirrored structure when you're using the upload file, because you can copy that automatic campaign that you created, paste it down and just change the word automatic to manual. And, and there you go. It's exactly the same. It has the same set of SKUs um, and it, it corresponds directly to that original automatic campaign. 
I think we built hundreds of campaigns, thousands of campaigns at this point. I think this has saved us hours. Oh, ab ab <laughs> absolutely. And and we'll we'll touch on this a little bit towards the end. But not only can you use the bulk file to create campaigns, but you can use it to do some bulk updates as well. So instead of you know going through one by one and adjusting bids or or adding new products, you can use the the bulk file once they're created to edit campaigns. Great. So we did touch upon budgets when initially setting them up in um, Seller Central, but this is a big question we get, you know, how much spend should I be allocating to my automatic, my manual, my different products here? And this is definitely something where you want to start a little bit lower and kind of adjust as you see the data coming in, um, just because, you know, especially when you know you're in season or it's during the holidays you never want to let your budget constrain grow so feeding that budget in and making sure there's always that cushion between your daily spend and your daily budget that's going to be key right so the the point on this is you know if you're cautious and just getting started start with something you're comfortable with ten dollars twenty dollars and just keep in mind there is a seven day attribution window to those sales. So if you see spend today, you're not gonna see those sales that correspond with those clicks until a couple days later. So don't be too um, cautious and turn it off right away if you're not seeing sales come in because that's gonna take a few extra days after the spend has already happened. Um, but once you have seen it run for a couple of weeks and you're okay with your ACOS, uh, that's at or below your target, you don't want to be hitting that daily budget because that just means your ads are turning off and you're no longer eligible for any impressions. So if you're hitting your daily budget, but you're okay with the efficiency that you're at, you're really constraining your growth because that means your ads are turning off in the middle of the day and you're missing out on further clicks. And it actually takes about 24 hours for that budget to update. So just being extra cautious, especially you know this past holiday season, that's gonna be really beneficial. Right, so uh, yeah, as you head into bigger days, like you know Prime Day, yeah. everyone will be getting ready for in the middle of the summer and any other Black Friday or Cyber Monday, stay ahead of those budget adjustments because it does take that 24 hours to update. And just because you set your budget at a certain value doesn't mean you're gonna spend that amount, it's just that cap. Right. It's a, it's a safety net. Um, I mean, the one thing uh, that we'll get questions about as well is how do I generate more spend? You know, if someone is OK with with their ACOS, their the efficiency looks good. They have a, a daily budget, say, of one hundred dollars, but they're only spending 50 bucks. They're saying, you know, I want to I want to spend more. What can I do? Um, the first thing you want to do is is look to try to increase your bids to try to get more placement because maybe you're missing out on some uh, on winning some of those auctions because your bids are too low. Um, if you've increased your bids and you're still not hitting that daily budget, it, it just may be that there's not enough search volume for that specific type of product. And unfortunately, you can't generate that search traffic. So you're somewhat constrained by the amount of people searching on Amazon. And the, the, the tip here at the bottom, so is if there is a single SKU in, uh, in one of your ad groups or campaigns that's accounting for the majority of your spend, you may want to move that to its own campaign. And what that will allow you to do is, is get some additional exposure for the rest of the SKUs in, in that ad group or campaign because the, the budget won't be eaten up by a single product that may be a top seller yeah. and, and generating a lot of the traffic. Any other questions coming in, Will, before we move on? I have one that is, I think we might hear this uh, 20 times a day here. What yeah. is a standard ACOS? Oh. Yeah, no, great question. We're actually going to kick off a poll uh, momentarily and sort of get the, the audience's feedback on that. Yeah. So one of our final steps in campaign creation is really tying a lot of these elements together and setting ACOS targets. So what this is going to be is what you're aiming for for your campaigns. I know this is a, a big KPM for a lot of sellers, getting it to a certain, certain ACOS uh, threshold. And you want to think of as these targets as the percentage of your product sales that you're dedicating um, to buy those clicks. So, um, for example, you want to be setting them to objectives of specific campaigns. So I know we've used the new um, raincoats as an example throughout the webinar. So if you have a, a product launch here, you want to be setting a higher ACUS target because you're willing to spend a lot more in clicks just to get that initial visibility for those um, products there. 
Yeah, and, and another thing that I always think about here when, when I'm asked, you know, what should the right ACOS be, you want to look back at the margin of, of your products yeah. as well. So when you take into account what you're selling it for, the cost of that product, the FBA fees, the Amazon referral fee, what are you taking home at the end of the day? You know, is that 20%? Um, if it is, then you could say anything, any any um, sale that I get with an ACOS under 20%, I'm making money on that sale. And another way to think about it is not all of your sales are coming from sponsored products. So we typically see maybe 15 to 30% of total sales coming from sponsored products. So I also encourage sellers to take that that spend and, and look at it over total sales, not just over the sales directly attributed to sponsored products. Because as we talked about early in the presentation, you're in that virtuous cycle and those that spend is not just benefiting the sales that you're getting directly from the clicks, but also your overall business. So even if your ACOS is 50% in the short term as you're launching a product, it may only be the marketing spend may only account for 10% of total sales. So take a step back and consider that every once in a while when you're when you're looking at your ACOS and how much you should target spending. And also targets are going to change over time. Your new product's not going to be a new product forever and you're going to have to be in a profitable stage at some point. So being able to adjust those targets along with the the life cycle stage there is going to be um, really key. Right. So uh, you know that's why we group those campaigns by product type and objective, because you can have a single target at that level. You know, as you move out of the launch phase, you're going to want to dial back that ACOS target because you don't want to be spending as much in the long term driving that traffic. So we're going to pepper in uh, just a few examples throughout the presentation of how these tips work when you're using the sponsored products optimizer. And at the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll let everyone know how to get in touch with us and get set up with a 30-day free trial. And what the software is going to do is make all of these steps uh, a lot easier, especially when we get into uh, all of the keyword actions uh, in, in the next part of the presentation. But here you can see an example where in, in, our, in our software, when you navigate to the campaign performance tab, you're actually able to set your ACOS target. And what that's going to do is inform the software how much you're willing to spend. And again, you may decide I'm willing to spend 50% in this, in this uh, product launch, or I want it to be under 10% because I have really you know, tight margins on this group of products. But what the software will allow you to do is set that ACOS target and it puts your bidding on autopilot. So our, our value-based bidder is going to take a look at the amount, number of impressions and the number of clicks and then of those clicks, how many clicks does it take to generate a sale? And once a sale is generated, how much is the average revenue per order? And then looking at your ACOS target, you're informing the system how much you're willing to spend as a percentage of that revenue. So each day it's recalculating based on the most current metrics. So if your conversion rate goes up, your willingness to bid is going to go higher. If for some reason your average revenue per order goes up, people are ordering more or your price increased, your bid is going to be increased by the system. So this is just one way that our sponsored products optimizer helps our sellers stay on top of all of their bidding and uh, lets them adjust their ACOS targets on the fly. Yeah, and I, a good way to kind of think of it too is a single concept of your bidding bandwidth. Um, how much wiggle room do you have to invest? You know, a new product is going to differ from a product in a profitable stage. Awesome. So I think getting to that question that Will just highlighted a few yeah. minutes ago, we'd love to get the, the audience's feedback here. So what is your average advertising cost of sale? Um, what are you typically seeing over, you know, the past couple of months? Let us know here. We have a couple different selections, 0 to 10%, 11 to 20%, 21 to 30, 31 to 50, or over 51%. So we'll give everyone a few seconds to enter in where they find their ACOS. And just as, a, as an aside for this presentation today, we will be sending a replay on Friday. So if any of those uh, steps that you just saw were a little bit confusing or you want to go back over them, we'll be sending a, a link out so you can review those on your own time. 
Yeah, and you can always hit up our, our YouTube page for all of the past webinars and, and go through the, the content that we've uh, prepared there. Great. So, so I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and share the results. And it looks like the majority of you are having an ACUS around the 11 to 20 percent right now. Yeah, and that, that actually is is right in line with what we see with our sellers. So, so uh, typically, I think the average, the last time I checked, was right around 18%. Um, obviously, this is going to be very different depending on your category or the, the life cycle of your product and, and what you're bidding. But um, over the thousands of sellers that we work with, we see the average range, and it depends on the time of year as well, but somewhere in that bucket that most of you did select between 11 to 20%. And that's not to say that those of you who have a higher ACOS are, are doing something wrong, but there may be opportunities for continued improvement. Um, but there are definitely categories that run higher than others. Yeah. All right, and just to recap, I know we went over a lot of steps in the campaign creation process, but first one is to focus on what products you want to advertise, whether it's your entire portfolio or ones that you can afford to advertise. Next, you want to group your products, so that's going to create the campaign and ad group hierarchy. And then having a great naming convention, um, definitely overlooked, but very, very important step here, creating um, a mirror campaign structure and, so yeah, and again, auto that, and manual. Yeah, it's exactly. An exploit. The mirrored means both the same thing you're doing with mm -hmm. automatic, do it for manual. Yep. Exact same campaign, exact same ad groups and same problems, yep. right? Yep. And then setting those budgets and establishing your targets as well. So I would actually take a second and screenshot this. I, you could tape this <laughs> up on your wall as the guide to actually setting up your campaigns. This is a, a great one to have because if you go through step one to eight, um, and you follow these directions, you're going to have amazing campaigns. So highly recommend uh, taking a look at this. So now that we've talked about getting set up for success, how to get those campaigns structured, what that looks like, you've got all your naming conventions all set. Let's talk a little bit more now about keywords and search terms. So we're going to go through a couple different examples here, but these are going to be really important as you kick off campaigns. So for the 15% of you out there that haven't yet started and the 35 to 40% of you that you know are, are relatively new within the past six months, you're going to want to make sure that you're taking these steps each week. So the first is reducing inefficient spend by adding negative keywords. So negative keywords are something that we haven't yet talked about today, but they're extremely powerful when you're, when you're looking to optimize your campaigns. So what they allow you to do is tell Amazon that you no longer want to bid on or show up for a specific search term. And you can use them both for automatic campaigns and manual campaigns, and they can be set at the ad group level or at the campaign level. And what we're looking at here is a little export from the customer search term report. So we've referenced this a couple of times. And for those of you who haven't yet downloaded one, again, this is going to be the richest data that you can find. And it, unfortunately, it's not right there in the campaign manager. So in Seller Central, you have to go to reports, advertising reports, and then you'll find it. You can set it up to automatically generate one each week for you, or you can click the button and have it generate one on demand. And what's the typical time frame? Yeah, so what this will pull down is a 60-day period. So it will look back over the last 60 days, and it will show you all of those customer search terms that have shown up. And I think, is, is it at least one click or one impression? Do you remember, Megan? Impression. Yeah. So, so what we're highlighting here is, is a few examples. So what you'll see is the customer search term rain poncho that's highlighted in red there. It has $71 of spend and zero orders. So what that's telling me is that there have been 204 clicks. Once someone entered in rain poncho, they clicked on the ad 204 times and not a single person purchased. So that's saying, I don't want to be spending on that term anymore. It looks like maybe Rain Poncho, maybe they're looking for something cheaper that's not quite uh, the, the product that we're selling. So in order to stop that spend, I can enter the term Rain Poncho as a negative exact match keyword, and I will, will no longer show up there. And you can think about all of those savings that you can get. If I can save 70 bucks over the next 60 days, 
it may sound like a small number now, but if you're t doing this each week, you're going to be shaving off all of that wasted spend and putting that spend towards, you know, those terms that are actually converting for you. Joe, do you typically recommend adding a negative keywords to both types of campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that, that sometimes gets overlooked because a lot of, of sellers will just use them in their automatic campaigns, but it can really improve the performance of a broad or phrase keyword. So this second example here it, where, where we see rain jackets for men is the customer search term. So the, the keyword in this case was rain jackets. So as we mentioned, there's three types of keywords. With the broad keyword, it can be any, any of those terms with any other terms in any order. So it's really, it is broad, that's why they call it broad. <laughs> so what you see here is that it's actually showing up in the children's raincoat ad group and the search term is rain jackets for men. So clearly they're, they're, it's not really relevant. Those are children's raincoats and the, the customer who's searching is looking for rain jackets for men but it's being served against that broad keyword of rain jackets. So what we can do here is add the, the negative exact match keyword rain jackets for men to that ad group. And what that will do is allow us to continue to show up for relevant searches with the rain jackets broad keyword, but it cuts out that waste for the rain jackets for men. So you can, you can see that I could afford more on, on the bidding side of things if I, on the broad keywords if I cut out the waste of those longer search terms that aren't relevant. And we actually do see relevant search terms that pop up that we do recommend to negate because it's hurting your conversion there. So I know a lot of sellers say try to stray away from that, but you really want to utilize the data to hone in on um, those potential ones. Yeah, even if it's your favorite keyword, it doesn't matter <laughs> because if it's not converting, you may not want to continue to spend on it. So, you know, you may have an idea of what the best search term or keyword is for your product, but if you're finding that you're getting hundreds of clicks without a sale, uh, that would put me back to the drawing board in terms of what's going wrong here. It's not sponsored products that's the problem in that case, it's your actual, you know, your offering. If 200 people have landed on your page, you're selling a rain jacket and the search term is rain jacket, why aren't they checking out? Is your price way too high compared to the competition? Are your images horrible? You know, it, it would prompt me to go back and, and take a look at my actual offering and see what's wrong if I'm seeing relevant terms with clicks and no sales. So back to the, the sponsored products optimizer and how this is going to really make it easy for everyone. Um, what we were just looking at is uh, was a little snippet of uh, an Excel sheet from the, the search term uh, report, and that can be tens of thousands of rows. So it's a ton of data to go through. Um, Megan and I know firsthand <laughs> fr from doing this manually over the, over the past couple of years, um, what the sponsored products optimizer is going to do and again, we'll, we'll get you guys all set up with, with the way to get a free trial, is it's gonna show you those search terms that are generating clicks and spend without sales. And you'll be able to log into our software, click those buttons, hit make changes, and your work will be done. So it's constantly going to be monitoring where there's spend without sales and showing you those negative keyword opportunities. And that's adding that on the ad group level. Yep. So, we talked a lot about the explore and exploit strategy, uh, and now we're going to get into why that's so important and, and how to do it. So when you have an automatic campaign and a manual campaign set up that are completely the same, the advantage there is that you're able to see which search terms work well on the automatic side and move them over to manual keywords. So by taking those efficient terms, you're able to bid on them individually. And as I was mentioning earlier, you may be willing to spend more on a specific term if you know that it converts well. On the other side, if something maybe generates some sales but not at the rate you'd like, if you move that over to a manual campaign, you can set the bid lower on that and, and maybe pick up some impressions and clicks, maybe not on page one. And what match type do you typically recommend? Yeah, so so when, when we're moving things from automatic over to manual, we recommend starting with the phrase match. So I, I view that automatic campaign sort of as the broad match, seeing how people are searching. By moving it over as a phrase, you're limiting your exposure to those dozens and dozens of search terms that can, that can be served against a broad keyword. The other advantage, um, and we haven't mentioned this, 
yet on the automatic side is not only is it going to give you data for search terms to move over to the manual campaign, but it's the only way to show up on your competitor's product page. So let's look at an example for automatic to manual. So what we see here is on the top where there's a customer search term of Patagonia raincoat. And you can tell that that comes from an automatic campaign because the keyword is an asterisk. That just means there is no keyword. With automatic campaigns, Amazon is matching your product directly with those customer searches. And when we look across to the right at all of the metrics associated with that search term, we see that there have been five orders generating almost $1,000 in sales, and you've only spent $76. So that has a very healthy ACOS under 8%. So I want to do more of that. And by making that customer search term Patagonia raincoat over in my manual campaigns, I'll then have the control to bid on that individually rather than just a single ad group level bid that corresponds to hundreds of different search terms. Another example, so the bottom one here, we see that there's very few impressions compared to the top example, but of the three clicks we've gotten, there have been two orders. So that's a very high conversion rate. So of the three people that have, have clicked on that page, landed on, on that um, product page, two of them checked out. So what that's telling me is that that's a highly relevant term and that customer is, is very qualified and they're, they want your product. So you don't want to be missing out on any of those terms because if you're not bidding high enough on the automatic side, you may miss out. If you move it over to manual and you see that it's performing well for you and converting at a high rate, you'll be able to dial up that bid and ensure that whenever anyone enters women waterproof jacket, your product's showing up because you have the highest bid because you know that two out of every three people who land on your page are purchasing. So how does this work in our software? Um, again, we've tried to make this as simple and straightforward as possible. So rather than pouring through those lines of Excel, what we allow you to do here is see those successful search terms from your automatic campaigns, and you can see that there's a select target ad group drop down. And what that's going to do is allow you to select the relevant ad group. And, and that's where, sorry to interrupt, but that's where that weird campaign structure where you can explore in the auto and exploit it in the manual is going to come in handy you can search exactly that campaign name and it's going to pop up there. Right. So if you are you were disciplined and you followed all the instructions that we, we outlined through the beginning of the presentation, you'll be able to find that green raincoats manual campaign right in that drop down and quickly move that term over from automatic to manual to make sure that you're always showing up. And the final step we have here, so we've talked about negating out terms that are no, are, aren't relevant or causing spend without sales. We've harvested our top performers, moved them from automatic over to manual. But once you're in manual, your work isn't, isn't done yet. We have those three different match types available to us. So if you think about the progression of a different keyword, you're going to maybe take a term from your automatic, move it over as a phrase match to your manual. But as you continue to collect data, a phrase match keyword can still generate dozens of search terms because it qualifies any string um, that's before or after works for that phrase. So you may say that you have a phrase match of women's raincoat, but people are searching black women's raincoat. Um, and because that's what you're selling, you're seeing that that longer tail term, black women's raincoat, converts even better than the term women's raincoat. So by identifying those longer tail terms, even though they may have fewer impressions and clicks, they may convert at a higher rate. So again, you may be willing to spend more on them. We typically find phrase match type actually works a lot more efficiently, ACOS wise, um, compared to the broad there. Absolutely. So yeah, think about moving from broad to phrase um, and then continuing to collect data. And as you see even more qualifiers on those search terms when people are getting really specific in their searches, you want to be able to capture that traffic and make sure you're the one showing up, not your competition. And once you get to exact, you know, you know exactly what you're bidding on. Not to use exact <laughs> too many times in a row there, but you know I can afford you know, $2 on black women's raincoat because it converts at such a high rate. I'm not bidding on anything else. I'm bidding on that exact term. When I'm bidding on raincoat, I'm bidding across 
hundreds of different search terms. And does that include just the exact string of words? Yeah, I guess it should be more, I guess you'd call it exact. almost exact, <laughs> right? Because it, it includes common misspellings in the pluralization. So let's go through a quick example, uh, and we have just about five or so minutes left in the presentation, so we'll go through this example, wrap things up, and then uh, leave room for a couple of minutes of questions at the end. So here, what we can see is that the keyword of North Face Raincoat as a broad term has been working well. It has two orders against it, it has an 8% ACOS, um, but what we found the search term was, was North Face Men's Raincoat. So rather than just continuing to bid on the broad, I want to move that entire search term over as a phrase match keyword and bid on that term specifically because it has proven to work. And again, this is, gets to the importance of relying on the data because rather than just having a handful of broad keywords out there, I'm going to get more specific as the data comes in and shows me what's working. And again, rather than just bidding on the broad term Patagonia, you can see Patagonia Rain Jacket works well in this example with an ACOS of 5%. So even with you know, lower impressions or lower clicks, I want to ensure that I'm showing up. So I'm, I'm using those phrase and exact match types and, and bidding those up because I know they work. And we recommend keeping the original keyword running as well because it found that opportunity and it'll probably find some more there. Yeah, we've talked about that explore and, and exploit in terms of automatic and manual, but you can also think about it within your manual campaign, exploring with broad and phrase keywords to generate even more search terms as you build out your backlog of winners and exact match keywords. So going to that third example of, of targeting improvements is what we call it in the sponsored products optimizer. This is going to show you all of those examples of creating more phrase and exact match keywords. So you can see in this in this screenshot of the software, rather than just the, the phrase kid raincoat, the term kid raincoat marmot, the brand, or small kid raincoat is what's working. And what you do here is simply check those boxes, hit make changes, and then those longer tail search terms will be created as new keywords in those ad groups. So let's bring it all together and then open it up for a few questions. So Megan did a great job earlier of walking us through what it takes to set yourself up for success and what that campaign structure should look like. We walked through that nine steps. Um, but looking at the second half of the presentation, what are our takeaways here? And I, Will, I really like you using the name takeaways with the, the interesting <laughs> spelling there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, so, so use both automatic and manual as part of that explore and exploit strategy. Reduce your wasted spend by using negative keywords. Refine your keyword targeting to become more competitive and reduce spending inefficiencies. And then, uh, as we talked about, you can really gain efficiencies uh, if you're not ready for software yet, like the Sponsored Products Optimizer, by making changes in bulk by using that bulk file through the campaign manager, bulk operations. Okay, so, so Q and A. We have a few minutes here before the top of the hour. Cool. So uh, we have one from Anne, and she's asking: Is it good to make sure high-performing keywords are in your page listing as well? Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's a great question. So not only should you be using that search term report to generate new uh, keywords for your sponsored products campaigns, but move those over to your title, bullet point, and description. As I mentioned earlier, there's no way you're going to get the organic uh, search results from Amazon. So by using that data, not only in sponsored products, but also in your listing, it's going to give you a, a nice boost. Even back-end keywords, you know, right. as they're limiting it now, you want to get the most relevant, high-performing ones. And even um, target audience, intended use, that's just really going to enhance your, your back-end details. And just think about this. If, if I'm searching for something as a, a buyer on Amazon.com and that exact search term is in the title of the product, I'm much more likely to click on it and explore that product page if I see what I'm searching for show up in the title. Great. So uh, next one we have is, do I need to put a negative keyword in the automatic group once I've moved it to the manual group? 
So yeah, there's a couple different strategies there. Um, you certainly can um, negate it out so that you're then controlling that bid on the manual side. You can also leave it um, depending on, on what you're looking to get out of that automatic campaign. If you view it exclusively as a way to generate search term data, um, you could negate it. So then that way, you know, you're using the budget on the automatic side to discover new keywords. I've seen both ways work with auto sellers. Great. And then uh, one last one before we wrap up. Uh, Ryan is asking, won't I be competing against a certain keyword bid in auto and manual campaigns? Yeah, so you're never really competing against yourself. Um, Amazon is going to enter you into the auction where you are the most relevant and at the highest bid, so you have the highest likelihood to show up. So there's no real concern for, for bidding yourself up. Amazon doesn't let you bid against yourself. You're, they're entering you into the auction one time. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. Just a few wrap up items here. Um, as I mentioned, we're offering a free 30 day trial. So as we walked through all of these optimization steps today, showed you a, a little preview of how they're done in the sponsored products optimizer. If that's something you're interested in, please do get in touch with us. Um, our sales team is, is ready to, uh, to engage with you and get you set up on a free trial. So you can shoot us an email at info at takeometrics.com and someone will get back to you quickly with uh, the next steps on how to get that free trial kicked off. And our next webinar, so we want to continue this masterclass approach. Um, there's a ton of content here that we haven't been able to get to in this hour today. So we'll continue the conversation towards the end of January on the 24th. And let me drop or Megan, can you drop that link into the chat um, so that everyone can uh, can join the webinar? That will also include this link in the uh, the follow up with the replay of the webinar. And that's about it. Lastly, you can uh, also join us tomorrow. We'll be doing a live Facebook, um, our weekly Take a TV episode. We'll be kicking off at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, even though there'll be quite a snowstorm here in the Northeast. We'll still be coming at you live. So if you want to continue the conversation, uh, join us there uh, on our Facebook live page tomorrow. If not, we hope to see you next uh, in the next couple of weeks on the next webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone.